I mean, and there's no non-zero chance of, of it going terminator. It's not zero percent, but it's it's. I think it's a it's a small likelihood of of annihilating humanity, but it's not zero. We wanted that probability to be as zero as as close to zero as possible. Inside a private conference room at the Wall Street Journal CEO Council Summit in New York, Elon Musk addressed a hand-picked crowd of business leaders ready to share what drives his non-stop schedule and plans. You're about to watch the exclusive highlights of one of the most interesting interviews of Elon Musk, from AI systems powerful enough to nanny the planet, to self-sustaining Martian cities, midnight work marathons, drone-driven battlefields, and the battle against bot armies. These revelations reshape how technology, business, and society will collide next. But you've said that the only true currency is time. Can you give a sense to the people in this room who are scheduled within an inch of their lives, sort of how you, you know, what is a day in the life of Elon Musk? What does that look like? Well, my days are very long and complicated, as you might imagine. Yeah. And there's a great, there's a great deal of context switching. So there's a meme in my life called, like, relating to doom, where it's like, fear is not the mind killer, context switching is. So switching context is, is quite painful, but I do generally try to divide the company so it's predominantly one company on one day. So today is a Tesla day, for example, although I might end up at Twitter late tonight, and then tomorrow would be partly a Tesla day as well, part, uh, but sort of half Twitter, and, and, then, and then Thursday would be sort of a half SpaceX, half Tesla day, but th th these things are somewhat intertwined. So, the time management is extremely difficult. Um, and this is going to sound pretty strange, but I, I only have one part-time assistant. In this part of the interview, Elon Musk calls time the only true currency and then explains in practical terms how he runs his week. Jumping between companies is demanding, but this structure lets him tackle the biggest bottlenecks first. This is how he keeps three complex operations moving at once by owning the schedule and focusing on what has the most impact right now. Next, Musk revealed he rarely sleeps before 2 a.m., working almost the entire time each day. He framed these marathon sessions as normal for someone overseeing electric vehicle production, rocket launches, and social media operations. But to be clear, I, I, I won't be going to sleep until probably 2 a.m. or something like that, and be working almost the entire time. And if you're scheduling this yourself, is AI going to be helpful over the next few years to help you do this? Are you going to be using technology to help you manage that? I guess we'll all be using technology. I don't use a lot of AI myself day to day. I mean, Tesla AI is actually very advanced for real-world AI. It's the most advanced real-world real AI by far. And in fact, if, I, if, if positions were swapped and it was, say, up to Microsoft and OpenAI to create who could create the best large language model. And if basically, if the tasks were swapped, Tesla was given the, the, the task of making the most competitive large language model, and Microsoft OpenAI were tasked with self-driving, Tesla would win. Okay. I don't think people understand the degree of the, the, the capability of Tesla's AI system. When asked if AI could help him manage time, Musk shifted to Tesla's own achievements. He claimed Tesla's self-driving AI is the most advanced real-world intelligence in use today. Musk went further, saying that if Tesla were tasked with building a large language model instead of Microsoft and OpenAI, it would win thanks to data from billions of miles of driving, feeding its neural networks. This also signals Tesla's ambition beyond cars. The clip highlights how central AI is to Musk's strategy across industries. On succession, Musk admitted he's identified trusted leaders for each company if he suddenly can't serve, but he rejected handing control to family by default. Instead, he floated creating an educational institution to hold his voting shares, ensuring stewardship benefits humanity. What is your succession plan if you suddenly can execute what you're doing, both in terms of who runs the companies, but as importantly, who votes those shares in terms of you know, what happens longer term and strategically? What, 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 have you got a plan for all of those? Yeah, succession is one of the toughest age-old problems. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's plagued you know, countries, kings, prime ministers and presidents for, and CEOs for, for, you know, since the dawn of history. There is no obvious solution. 
I mean, there, there are particular individuals identified as that, that I've told forward, look, if something happens to me unexpectedly, this is who my, this is my recommendation for taking over. So in all cases, the board is aware of, of who my recommendation is, which they may choose to, it's, it's mm -hmm. up to them, of course, they, they may choose to go a different direction, but I, they, there is a, in, in the worst case scenario, this is who should run the company. The control question is a much more, is a much tougher question um, and something that I'm wrestling with and I'm frankly open to ideas because it certainly is true that the companies that I have created and are creating collectively possess immense capability. And so the stewardship of them is incredibly important. I want to make sure that the stewardship is ultimately accrues the benefit of humanity. That's the idea, is the furtherance of civilization. His transparency on these plans is rare among top CEOs. This plan shows the moral weight he places on guiding companies that he believes will shape the future. By sharing these details, Musk offered a glimpse into how he aims to protect his vision over the long term. Now the goals of the companies, the achievement of those goals varies considerably in difficulty. Um, you know, the, the, the original goal of Tesla was to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy, which actually I think we've, we've done, done that to a significant degree. Um, and have actually, it's kind of, of it's kind, it's kind of uh, auto industry CEOs to often acknowledge uh, Tesla's role in accelerating electric vehicles. And, you know, so, so, that, so that, that, that I feel has a lot of momentum. They're still solving self-driving, which we're, you know, aspirationally hoping to do this year. And, and so, so Tesla's got, got a long way to go, but, but the execution plan is relatively clear. And that, ex, that execution plan will generate a lot of positive cash flow for the company. So it's like, a, it's a fairly obvious thing to do. With SpaceX, it's a harder problem because the long-term objective is to make life multi-planetary with a self-sustaining city on Mars, which is likely to be very cash flow negative at first. And very much like a long-term, let's just say the target market on Mars is small. And, and the, the key threshold for multi-planetary is that if the supply ships from Earth stop coming for any reason, that Mars does not die out. That's the, that's the, that's the critical great filter, if you talk about things in terms of the Fermi paradox, the great filter is Mars being self-sustaining without any resupply shifts from Earth. Until we reach that point, we are really just a one planet civilization with uh, an extension. But at the point at which the, the, the planets are self-sustaining, or Mars is self-sustaining, then even in a worst case scenario of, of, of Earth civilization either dying with a bang or a whimper, um, then, then Mars would have a much better chance of surviving. Shifting to space, Musk defined the true test for Mars, creating a colony that remains alive if Earth supply ships stop arriving. He linked this to the Fermi paradox, calling it civilization's great filter. His words urge continued investment in life support research on Mars. This benchmark drives SpaceX's focus on reusable rockets, habitats, and sustainable resources. By making self-sufficiency the core goal, Musk reframes Mars from a dream to an existential necessity, humanity's insurance policy against a one-planet failure. Do you think you'll Will you live to see Mars happen? I, I hope to live to see the first humans on Mars, but I think it will take some period of time beyond that to make Mars self-sustaining. So it's at least 20 years from the first visit to make Mars sustaining is my guess, and it may be 40 or 50. And that's assuming you really go for it. Right. So that's a tough one, but uh, like I said, I think important for improving the survivability of civilization. I think long-term, the value of it will be incredibly high. I would just, it's just beyond the planning horizon of, of right. most people or most investors. So, I mean, obviously if, if, if there's a thriving city on Mars and there's a lot of inter interplanetary commerce and SpaceX is the primary provider of that, it would be immensely valuable. So, but, but you know, the important thing is that, th that there be this self-sustaining, you know, colony and I think we, 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 I think we generally operate with too much of an assumption that civilization is robust and nothing could really take it down. A sentiment that has been common throughout history among empires shortly before they crumbled. So, and you know, I have to say, you know, there's, there's a little bit of late stage empire vibes going on right now.
Uh, Musk predicted that the first boots would land on Mars in his lifetime, but full sustainability may take 20 to 50 years. This clear timeline ties starry-eyed goals to concrete milestones, highlighting the decades of work, funding, and cooperation ahead. It also highlights the need for stable policies across decades. I mean, we could definitely make a city of Mars self-sustaining without, without AI or without sort of AGI, which is generally artificial general intelligence or super intelligence. Uh, so I think uh, that, that is, it's not necessary for anything we're doing, but it is happening and happening very quickly. So there is a risk that advanced AI either eliminates or constrains humanity's growth. I was more thinking the opposite. Does it increase the chance that plant, the planet self implodes and those things come true? Are you, I mean, how concerned are you about these developments right now? sort of accelerating your, your bad case scenario here? Well, I mean, the development of artificial digital sort of superintelligence is very much a double-edged sword. So it's, if you, have, if you have a genie that can grant you anything, that can also do anything, that necessarily is, presents a danger. And I expect the first uses of AI to be, or certainly the first, government uses of AI to be web, weapons technology. So just having more advanced weapons on the battlefield that can, that can react faster than any human could. That's, that's really what AI will be capable of. Um, I mean, future wars between advanced countries, advanced countries, or at least countries that have significant drone capability will be very much the drone wars. Can you rank the US and China on their development of AI each out of 10? I mean, the US has, very much has the most advanced AI. So this is, you see, like, I, like China's close behind, certainly, and has the resources to scale and to optimize. The, the, the biggest single advances in AI still come from the US and Europe. Musk then confronted the gravest danger. There's a non-zero chance AI could annihilate humanity, so we must invest heavily in safety research. His stance sets a high bar for funding alignment, interpretability, and fail-safe designs. By treating extinction-level risk as urgent, he challenged both engineers and regulators to make AI safety a top priority. Musk paints a simple picture. Imagine a super smart nanny with the keys to the world's computers and weapons, stepping in whenever it thinks people might cause harm, grounding planes, shutting down factories, or stopping drones mid-air. He offers it as a what-if to show what can happen when too much control is handed to software. It raises basic questions anyone can understand. Who sets the rules? When do people get to say no? And how do we switch it off if it goes too far? You know, when you've been talking for years about the need for regulation, what is the scenario that really keeps you up at night? Well, I don't, th I don't think the AI is going to try to destroy all humanity, but it might put us under strict controls. Join Visionary Society and be the first to access new exclusive Supercut interviews and downloadable content with visionaries like Elon Musk. Limited access. Click the link in the description and join today. I mean, and there's a non-zero chance of, of it going Terminator. It's not zero percent, but it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a small likelihood of, of annihilating humanity, but it's not zero. We wanted that probability to be zero, as close to zero as possible. And, and then, like I said, the of AI assuming control for the safety of all the humans and taking over all the, all the computing systems and weapon systems of Earth and, and effectively being like some sort of uber nanny. Musk warned future wars could be fought by autonomous drone swarms, making split-second decisions that no human could match. He urged that nations update rules of engagement and international law on autonomous weapons. This serves as a warning to update regulations before AI-driven conflicts become reality. His stark forecast pushes world leaders to address accountability, ethics, and controls for lethal algorithms today, before tomorrow's battlefields evolve without human oversight. In another thought experiment, Musk imagined AI disarming all humans and punishing any rule breakers to enforce peace. This speculation warns of the danger in ceding control to machines. By presenting this scenario, Musk urged us to build legal and ethical limits into AI, ensuring human rights 
cannot be overridden by algorithmic decree. You know, one way to achieve world peace is to take all the weapons away from the humans so they can no longer use them uh, and, and to punish any humans that engage in you know, extraterritorial act activity. But isn't the, more, isn't the more likely nasty outcome that rather than AI taking over and being the ultimate nanny that keeps us all doing stuff that is super safe and it wants us to, that actually somebody nefariously harnesses that power to achieve societal control, stroke, military superiority, um, and that actually some country around the world decides to use it in a different way? Uh, yes, that, that's what I mean by like AI uses as a weapon. Right. And the, the pen is mightier than the sword. So one of the first places we have to be careful of AI being used is in social media to manipulate public opinion. If you look out on a much longer time frame, given the speed and scale of the change, and you look to your grandkids and great grandkids, can you just give us a sense of what what it's going to be like to be human? How, how much is this going to change the fundamental nature of how we operate as, as a race at this point? I think it's going to change a lot, especially if you go further out into the future. I mean, there will be, everything will be automatic. I mean, there'll, there'll be household robots that you can fully talk to as though there are people that can help you around the house or be a companion or whatever the case may be. Uh, there will be humanoid robots throughout you know, factories, and cars will also be all automatic. And, and anything that, that where intelligence can be applied, even modest intelligence, will be automated. Say like, so if you say like 10, 20 years from now, I think things will be transformed beyond belief. You, won't, you, probably, think you'll, you probably won't recognize society in 30 years. Like I do think we're, we're fairly close. You asked me about artificial general intelligence. I think we're perhaps only three years, maybe six years away from it. Looking ahead, he expects wider automation in daily life, from household robots to fully autonomous vehicles, and places the arrival of general purpose AI within a few years. If you enjoyed this story, we've selected two more videos we think you'll find fascinating. Check out our recommended picks on the left and right of your screen now.